Spy gadgets are fun to look at, and today we take apart the gadgets in Moonraker with our special guest, Joe Papalardo. Hi, this is Dan Silvestri. And Tom Pizzotto. I'm Vicki Hodges. From SpyMovieNavigator.com on our podcast show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies. We have a return visit from our special guest today and our smartest spy in the room segment, Joe Papalardo, an author and magazine contributor to Smithsonian Air and Space, National Geographic, and Popular Mechanics. Joe has written articles about space industrialists like Drax and spy satellites in space. And he wrote the book Inferno, the true story of a B-17 gunner's heroism and the bloodiest military campaign in aviation history. It's available on Amazon.com. Go check it out. So we're excited to get his insights into Moonraker. Let's go. All right. Everything's a gadget in this far out space flick. The laser guns, the space station, everything, but some based on real stuff. We had space stations in 1979. In fact, they moved this film up ahead of For Your Eyes Only to take advantage of the interest in space movies like Close Encounters of the Third Kind, Alien, and Star Trek, and others. In the pre-title sequence, we see the hijacking of a space shuttle that we later find out that Drax is behind. In the sense, the shuttle is a huge gadget, but the hijacking... Hey, Joe, what, what do you think of a space shuttle hijacking like they did it in Moonraker. The actual heist is absurd. The, the one thing I really like about it is that they, there actually was a transport system where they'd put the shuttle on top of a, a commercial airliner and move it from place to place. So that part of it actually is true. Now, the, the part that it gets ridiculous is when they climb into it and fly it away, obviously. The reason the shuttle had those huge orange tanks and it was to give the fuel and the oxidizer to make that thing fly. It's just way too heavy to fly. So you can't just light the engines and go and zip off the, the top of, a, of an airplane. Even if that was, you know, the physics made sense, the actual rocketry does not. So that that is a patently absurd portion of it. And also the fact that Drax flies it back to his headquarters. I mean, that's not an airplane. That's a space plane. And space <laughs> planes are essentially gliders when they come back down. Well, that's why they have the 747 to move it from place right. to place. If it could fly on its own, it would, right? Yeah. So it's, uh, it, it's, it's, a, it's a dumb heist um, at the end of the day, <laughs> unfortunately. All right. And this is the free title sequence. This is how we start. <laughs> exactly. <laughs> All right. But we have to keep in mind that in real life, the space shuttle developed by NASA was in development at the time, but its first launch wasn't really until April 12, 1981, two years after Moonraker came out. So the public may have known some things about the shuttle, but you wouldn't know a heck of a lot about the shuttle. So well, in Dan, real actually, life. Let, let me stop you there for a second though, Dan, because yeah. their actual first launch was in 81, but they did five test flights in 1977 yeah, where they true. had the shuttle on top of the carrier, the 747. Mm -hmm. And that was two years beforehand. So I really like the way they did the modeling on this because the that really was what the space shuttle Endeavor looked like on oh, yeah. its last two flights in the testing. And the first first couple of tests, they actually had this thing on the on the back for aerodynamics on the, on the tail section, so you didn't see the exposed uh, I don't know rockets or exhaust or whatever those things are. But this <laughs> thing really was. If you actually look at the pictures, they did a pretty good job with those models on how they actually did that. Now, one thing that I also liked about it is the 747, they only had one of them initially, and it was one they got from American Airlines. So the cheat line, which is the striping that goes all along the fuselage, is the blue, white, and red going from top to bottom that you see on the American Airlines planes. And so for the first few years, they actually kept that sheet line on it. So it was nice to see that. Obviously, the rest of the decals were for Drax, not for NASA. So mm -hmm. that would have been different. I really like that. And then finally, the, the last touch that I really liked is on the tail, it says the number 905, which actually was the tail number of the real 747 that acted as the shuttle carrier. I really like the way they did the modeling on this thing and the way they did the coloring and that cheat line. I thought that was made it more authentic feeling. Yeah. I mean, it really looked like the shuttle, right, Joe? I mean, it looked pretty authentic for the, for as a shuttle. Making the sequence even more frustrating. I mean, it's like, <laughs> you know, modeling out a perfect Sherman tank and having it fight a, a dinosaur. I mean, it's, <laughs> I mean it's, it's, to me, that's more frustrating. I mean, and, and it was early in the shuttle development program and it's a, it, it, to me, these are movies are sort of teachable moments, right? And 
they, you know, it, 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 they got it so wrong that it seems like a lost opportunity since they went through the work of getting the modeling right. <laughs> okay. When Bond is meeting MQ and Freddie Gray for the briefing on the missing shuttle, Q presses a button on a mirror's frame. The mirror gets replaced by a monitor showing the wreckage of the 747 crash. The monitor comes in with a wipe transition. Now, the wipe transition has been used extensively in the Star Wars series, and they used it here as well. As for the monitor, that would have been doable. I don't know if the technology existed in 1979 to do a wipe move from mirror to a clunky 1979 monitor. However, we do have mirrors today that have embedded monitors. So this is a bit realistic and with the white move, a bit futuristic too. Then we see Jaws and his metal teeth. I can see where you can have metal teeth. Okay. George Washington, the first US president was rumored to have wooden teeth. So metal might be a little more durable. So, okay, <laughs> I could go along with him maybe having metal teeth. Yeah, but the question I have on that scene is where the heck was he hiding? That plane was not very large, and you and saw the whole you saw the whole plane, the interior of the plane in most of the shots, and then all of a sudden he's standing there at the door. There is someone else in the cockpit, I think. Uh, that you kind of see a shoulder, I think. Pretty, pretty sure on the right side of the screen, I think you do see some kind of shoulder or something in the cockpit. The thing that gets me about his teeth, though, is, and this is kind of like Teehee's prosthetic arm in Live and Let Die, it's it's like if you don't have the other object that you're going to crunch in a vice or something, then your other hand, or in his case, his teeth, he would have to have the tensile strength to be able to crush something or whatever. It's not just the teeth or it's not just the arm. You got you to gotta have the power to do that anyway. But I'm going to let that slide because that's part of my willing suspension of disbelief. Dan, when he was biting cables and stuff, that was all just licorice. Don't worry about it. I know. Delicious <laughs> licorice. <laughs> <laughs> that I think you could do. And then we see Q provide the wrist gun, which we will talk about. Standard equipment activated by nerve impulses from the wrist. Yeah, I kind of like that. And we'll talk about the wrist gun in a little bit because he uses it a couple of times. And it's, come, you know, Q again comes up with some pretty handy devices <laughs> and gadgets for, for Bond. But Drax... He was an industrialist, right, Joe? Yeah, I mean, I think the, the interesting thing about his scheme, if you look at it, you know, how, how the movie ages well or it doesn't, it does sort of, his scheme sort of hits on sort of the, the Gattaca effect, as, as like some people call it, where space flight is opened up to rich people, industrialists, people who can afford it, and leaving the rest of us behind to a crappy, you know, dystopian earthbound future. So, you know, Drax, his scheme is the ultimate embodiment of that, which is, get my people into space and kill everybody else and come back. It's, it, it's a manifestation sort of reflection of what, what's sort of happening now, space tourism, who gets affords to go, who's behind the, the biggest space companies, Jeff Bezos and Elon Musk, and is there a have and have not sort of dynamic at play? And, and that, that sort of, that informs me watching the movie now, whenever there's the industrialist, you know, the Titan who's got a, a scheme to go into space, you know, by himself, well, we got two of them right now. You know, they're launching even as we speak. Yeah. So once again, Ian is predicting the future in their Bond movies. Yeah. Although I do it's like the fact cool. that we have two of them right now. So they're having yeah. to fight each other off, which is kind of well, nice. Then, then you've got a William Gibson kind of a future where the, the industrialists are sort of at war and they replace the nation states. So, you know, uh, you, you, never, you never know what dystopian future you're going to stumble into when you start going down these rabbit holes. Yeah. Yeah. When Bond is flying to Drax's villa and stuff, the pilot is is flying him and looking over all of these beautiful things, all these buildings, all these all the grounds, all the facilities, the beautiful mansion and everything else. And and Bond's pretty impressed. The pilot says to him, Well, what he he doesn't own, he doesn't want. Comes out he owns the Eiffel Tower too, which, you know, <laughs> they wouldn't let him move. So it's like, okay, that was carrying it a little far. But. Yeah, but I could see Bezos trying to do that. <laughs> yeah. You know, Bill Gates bought the Leonardo da Vinci uh, code book or whatever, didn't he? The, yeah, he did. It was, some, it was something like that, one of the da Vinci things. One of his sketchbooks that yeah. uh, is now, I guess, 
visible to the world because it's going around in, the, in museums. All right. The next thing I want to talk about is the centrifuge trainer. I mean, it's the gadgets for astronaut training and it, it seems real, realistic. Although Goodhead tells Bond that the machine can go up to 20 G's, but she says that would be fatal. She says three G's is the equivalent to takeoff pressure and most people pass out around seven, which is when Bond first tries to release the chicken switch. He actually went up to 13. Now, according to medicaldaily.com, there was an Air Force officer, John Stapp, who demonstrated that a human could withstand 46.2 Gs in an experiment, but it only lasted a few seconds. Right? So it does go on to say that one of the roller coaster designs, which is where they do a lot of this testing for G-forces, lethal exposure would be 10 Gs for one minute. So the training gadget seems real. The numbers may be a bit off. But in any case, Bond would have had issues because he had some issues when he got off of that thing with the G-forces he achieved, especially over the course of the two minutes that he was in that contraption. Yeah, but it's a real contraption, yeah. right, Joe? I mean, they really use this kind of thing in space training. They, they use it now. I mean, it's, a, it, it's the best way. I mean, how fast you spin, is that is gravity, right? So, I mean, a spaceship that spins, that's our, a way to make artificial gravity is another way of sort of looking at it. But... The, uh, you know, the, the duration is one, certainly a, a huge part of it. I just interviewed an astronaut who survived a, a, an unplanned reentry during a launch of the Soyuz. And, and during a previous launch, a Russian had experienced up to 20 Gs coming back down. It, there's a lot of training. I mean, Bond is extremely physically fit, right? So he's got bit, a lot of core strength. So that helps you not pass out. And knowing what to do during that situation, which Bond knows everything. So of course he does. So <laughs> there's things you can do to survive that situation that pilots do when they're, when they're pulling tight G's and they need to perform. But no one can withstand it for long periods of time. And, and lower G forces at very low periods of time is damaging as well, which is something you have to consider on long duration flights to Mars and stuff like that which is another thing I cover. So there's a lot of real world applications as to what G-forces do to the human body. We're optimized for 1G, life on planet Earth. I mean, that's, that's where we evolved and anything outside that is pretty much inherently damaging. But there's things you can do about it if you're ever caught in a centrifuge by you know, villains. <laughs> yeah, shoot a wrist dart at the thing and have it stop. <laughs> <laughs> that would be my first go-to, yeah. <laughs> Hey, at least he's conscious enough to talk. And just like Joe said, you know, he's well trained. All right. We have another gadget here. Corinne, she was the pilot showing Bond to the estate and so on. She shows Bond Drax's safe. She looked at it and he said, okay, that's where it is. Thanks. Didn't exactly tell him where it was. But the safe rises from a clock on top of this bureau. And the safe itself is a gadget, but so is Bond's safe cracking device. Bond's safe cracking device here is pretty cool, though it's disguised as a cigarette case. And when open, it's set against the safe and it has an x-ray capability to show the tumblers and everything and a digital readout as well. And I was wondering, if you're getting a digital readout, what do you need the x-ray capability for? I mean, you got to see this stuff and get a digital readout? Uh, I don't understand that part. But maybe it's just to be cool and to show us, hey, you know, this is kind of cool stuff. And he uses it as a gag when he holds it up against uh, Corinne's heart and says, you have a heart of gold. That's maybe that's the joke. But I, I say, uh, no, I don't think you're going to be able to have a gadget that size to crack a safe like that, Joe. I, I don't know. I, it seems odd to me that you could have this device in 1979. Yeah, I mean, the, the, I think the, the digital display was for the viewers, not so much the spy. <laughs> but, you know, safe cracking is a, is a, is a, noble, a noble and ancient sport. And the, the interesting thing, and whenever I see the, the hidden, you know, safe in the wall or something, that, that if it's disguised, that's its main defense. A safe out in the open needs a really complicated lock. So I, you know, and I'm all about redundancy as well. But if you know where it's hidden, you know, I, I, that's what really got me about that scene. Not so much the, the gadget because X-ray technology has been around for obviously a long time. It's been been used before. Lead lining of safes, you know, made right. some of that not not very practical, right? But 
but at the end of the day, whenever I see a, a movie set in this age and, and there's a safe cracking, there's something digital, I always think of the modern implication of hacking or something or what that would look like today. And it would be all digital, right? And, and yeah, yeah. it would be magic if there's no, there wouldn't be any, at least there was an attempt to show you what was happening mechanically. Whereas today it's almost like Merlin shows up and the doors open or the, you know, yeah, the yeah, that's true. lights change or whatever it is. So I kind of like that there was a very, there was almost the practitioner part of it. You needed to be trained on how to use this device. It wasn't yeah. just magic. So there was something kind of cool about it, even, even though, yeah, it was kind of silly and teched up for no great reason. There was some, there was some thought behind it. I'll give them some, you know, pun intended, some props for that one. <laughs> Yeah, but I, I suppose uh, we need to remember this was the late 70s and not the 60s, so there is a slight different view on this one. Although throughout the Bond series, we've seen different cracking devices of different sizes. You Only Live Twice, On Her Majesty's Secret Service. These are just two examples that precede this movie. There are safe cracking devices that use x-rays to see the configuration and deduce the combination that probably would have been usable in 1979. As Joe has alluded to, they're using lead lined and nylon now to help with this. So the technology might have existed to do what they showed. But my guess is that it wouldn't have been doable in something as compact as Bond's cigarette case. The, the interesting thing you point out about the 70s too, it's the age of digitization and miniaturization that we're sort of still experiencing now. Everything is getting smaller. Everything is getting more compact and little powerful, you know, computers that took up a room are shrinking and, and really forward looking people are seeing things get smaller and more personal, personal devices are starting to become a, a concept, right? So yeah. they're just projecting what's coming in, in a way. So uh, again, like looking, looking ahead, it is not a great device, but it's, when you think about what's the, th the thought process behind that device at the time that the movie came out, it really is on trend. It's on futuristic trend. So it's kind of cool. It's great that you pointed out that it was set in the seventies. That's where the mindset was space, small yeah. things, personal yeah. gadgetry, all the stuff we're enjoying right now, quite frankly. Yeah. And speaking of miniaturization, the miniature camera <laughs> that Bond uses to photograph what's in Drax's safe is yeah. Okay. Yeah. Miniature cameras have been around a while. The first functional prototype was made in 1936. Walter Zapp, who was a German born guy in Latvia in 1905, began development of a miniature camera in 1932. So this is not a problem for Bond to have one in 1979. But really, you're a spy. What's Q Branch doing with the lens where the O, the, the second O of 007 is the lens? <laughs> and it says 007 on the thing. Really, come on. Not that it matters because everybody in the world knows who James Bond is. And everywhere he walks, oh, you're Bond. We're going to kill you, whatever. But geez, let's let's make it obvious, I guess. You know, supposedly somebody doesn't know who James Bond might be, and he gets captured, and they get his camera. Oh, oh, double O seven. <sighs> anyway, it's cute, <laughs> but geez, give us a break. But remember, in Live and Let Die, the, the cards that a solitaire was dealing had double O seven in there secretly. Maybe one of their little cute devices <laughs> anyway i don't like the 007 on the lens <laughs> sorry i don't know my least favorite gadget of all time <laughs> in any spy movie is the gondola or more affectionately referred to as the bondola which is a motorized gondola What's that races down like? the canal <laughs> eight What's that to like? <laughs> I like that. It's obviously in, in Venice, you can't cause wakes with motorboats and stuff, but he's got no problem with this. A motorized gondola racing down the canals. And then it turns into this land vehicle when it, this inflatable <laughs> thing pops out the bottom when he's trying to escape his water pursuers. Yeah, well, I mean, it turns into a hovercraft, and that's why you have the controls that say turbofan and vanes yeah. as an option. There's no wheels. It just turns into a hovercraft, which is... Kind of really goofy. Uh, yeah, this was madness. I mean, just in case you might need a gondola that can go on land. Just, just in case, Bond, we got one. And it, we're shipping it to Venice. I mean, <laughs> I don't know. Come on, this always, wasn't always camping. Always remember, with, with flying cars and with boats that turn into vehicles, if uh, it's something the engineers always say, if something's built to be 
two things, it's bad at both. And that's a terrible <laughs> high speed boat and not a very good vehicle on the land either. So, you know, it was a ridiculous thing, but it showed how ridiculous that concept really is. Cause right. How many times do you need that particular combination? But it's really terrible at both. I mean, you're not getting a high quality vehicle either way. Yeah. The only salvation to this whole thing was the pigeon doing the double take. <laughs> it, it, so. That, that saved the scene. It's like, okay, have the gondola. That's fine. A supporting actor. Uh, uh, other than the, maybe the, the disappearing car, the Vanquish in Die Another Day. That's another one of my least favorite gadgets, but this one's tough to take. Ah, but while Die Another Day is lower down on my ranking of Bond films, I don't actually mind the invisible car. It's mm-hmm. Halle Berry and the second half of the film that's my problem. <laughs> Well, the second half of the, this film is my problem with this film because the first <laughs> half of it, it's actually a pretty decent spy movie. Yeah, I actually, I, you know, when I'm watching it two or three more times, I'm thinking, well, actually, I, I almost like three quarters of it. Yeah. <laughs> but uh, but then, <laughs> then it gets a little iffy. The book itself is fabulous reading. If you ever want to pick up Ian Fleming's book for Moonraker, it, it's really a great read. Yeah, well, they, they had to change the story, though, Dan, because when he wrote Moonraker, rockets yeah. were fairly new. Yeah, we talked about yeah, this. Yeah, so, but one thing I do like that they did that's not a gadget, but from, from, from the book was how they end up underneath the rocket where they're going to get yes. blasted away. That yes. actually came out of the book, so that yes. was really yes. nice to see. It was, it was. And in this scene, of course, with the gondola thing, uh, there's a funeral boat that passes his gondola. Okay, it's one more way, as we're going to see, not to kill Bond. (laughs) We've seen tons of ways, all right? And as the gadget casket opens, and what we assume is a professional knife thrower throws a knife at Bond, he hits the gondolier. Maybe that was his intention first. But he throws another, and he misses. And Bond takes it and throws it back at the knife, and boom! Knife killer's dead. Okay, Bond is better even at throwing knives than a professional knife thrower, which, okay, maybe, maybe he is. That's fine. But how about having an automatic rifle on that thing and just shooting the hell out of Bond in the boat instead of a freaking knife? I mean, come on. Or, or have it shoot hand grenades or something at it. Yeah, something. <laughs> because they're willing to do that, obviously, because after the knife thing fails, there's a guy in the boat shooting an automatic weapon at Bond, and then they're chasing him shooting automatic weapons at Bond. So why not do that first? Ah, I don't know. I don't know. It just drives me crazy. Yeah, now this <laughs> is the second Roger Moore movie with a tricked-out casket. So in oh, yeah, Live and Let true. Die... They had the, the casket where they put it over the body and they picked up the body. In this case, the casket opens by itself. The, there's the spinning knife thing. So it's pretty cool. You could see somebody trying to build this, whether it's practical or not, it's a different thing. But you could actually see some, some goon going like, hey, let's do this and having that work like that. I like that this is not just any old coffin, but one with rotating knives for selection. <laughs> where is the fun in just having a henchman with a gun? <laughs> Because Bond would be dead. <laughs> That's the goal. Yeah, exactly. Where was the fun in that? Hey, speaking of spies and their gadgets, we know spies love coffee. And we found a great one for you with a perfect name, Spy Coffees. And you get 20% off with roasts like Spy Master Dark Roast or Double Agent Medium Roast, my favorite. Or Agent Blend Light Roast in whole bean, ground, or even some K-Cups. I'm drinking some right now. Make a clandestine trip to spycoffees.com and use the code SPYNAV, S-P-Y-N-A-V, at checkout and get 20% off spycoffees.com. They're one of our sponsors. Support them. We appreciate it. Thanks. Okay, so when Bond initially discovers the lab with the nerve gas, there is a gadget on the wall, which is a keypad to enter the room. Obviously, this is a believable gadget, but what makes this one notable sorry for the pun, is that the correct numbers play the five keynotes from the movie Close Encounters of the Third Kind. 2001 A Space Odyssey and The Magnificent Seven also have their music represented in this movie. Yeah, 2001 A Space Odyssey, which is one of my all-time favorite movies, features the music from Richard Strauss, or Richard Strauss, from his music, Auszu Sprach Zarathustra. It's fantastic, and you know I collect autographs, and I actually have Richard Strauss's autograph. All right, Drax's space station. Okay, wow, uh, this is a this is 
This is something in itself. The whole thing's a gadget, but it has a radar jamming system, so no one on Earth knows it's there. Okay, it's, it's 1979. We have tons of satellites in space in 1979. Hard to believe a radar jamming device would render the gigantic space station virtually invisible to technology. Okay, no, I, I'm saying no. That's impossible in 1979. The station also has a gravity device. The station rotates to create artificial gravity, really, like a centrifugal force, even with strong centrifugal force at work, meaning the space station must rotate rapidly to create a push to the outer walls. Well, yikes, is that going to happen in 1979? Absolutely not. It's not happening now in our space station. No way. Well, it has not been done yet, only in movies like 2001 A Space Odyssey, which we mentioned already. So this one is really a stretch to realism, and we cannot gravitate towards this one. Oh, damn. <laughs> I'll gravitate towards it. <laughs> I'll, gravitate, no, I'll gravitate towards it all day long. I love, I love space stations, and it, it's impossible for them to do at the time, but... There are private space stations being designed. There's there's one attached to the International Space Station. They're talking about butting out other ones. The time of private space stations is, is almost upon us. So the thing about gravity that you bring out as well, microgravity um, or zero gravity is bad. Microgravity is better. So it doesn't have to spin to one G's worth of spin to have benefit. So if it's spinning a little more slowly, you're getting... Let you know you're not getting the full gravity, but you're getting something that's better and better for you and better for better for long duration flight, certainly. So I, I see a space station. I'm always looking for the for the, the glimmer of hope rather than the absurdity. Well, I, actually, I, I'm gonna I'm gonna ask you a question about what I think is a little absurd. They're going to the tunnels and there's no there's no zero gravity or microgravity there. Right. But when they're out of the tunnel, there is. If the spinning is causing it, how are the tunnels not spinning? Yeah, well, the, the, the rule of thumb is always the, you know, the farther out you are, the more gravity you're getting. So it all depends on what the, the axis it's spinning around. So everywhere is getting it. It's, all, you know, so, but the, 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 the determination, if you're close in to the center of where it's spinning, you're getting no benefit if you're farther out you're getting the greatest benefit right. so and the, and the tunnels tended to be out exactly <laughs> there should be <laughs> they have it exactly backwards yeah. is what it like. <laughs> so then the other thing that i noticed too is when bond hits the emergency stop button the thrusters come on but that spin stops like that on a dime and my guess is it's not going to even with the thrusters it's not going to be able to stop instantly like that well nothing ever stops instantly but but in space without the resistance of any air things do you know a little nudge goes a long way that that was an extreme amount of of thrust that was shown right. that would be enough to maybe even like change an orbit probably but so it, it wouldn't take very long the, the danger isn't that you overdo it I mean, that you underdo it so that you overdo it and really send that spaceship into an uncontrolled spin or a deorbit burn or or out you know into uh into the farther reaches so you don't want to play around with stuff like that when you're in space so i thought that was extremely reckless of bond to do it yeah. <laughs> well he's reckless there a you lot. Go. <laughs> now what about their the radar cloaking devices here i mean we we know about star trek and the klingons and they have cloaking devices but he's got a, he's got some device here that that makes it invisible to to radar on earth it's it, it's, it's easy to imagine a cloaked space system it's it, it, radar is one of them one way to do it and and the reason i i know about this is because this is what people are discussing right now how do you know what's in orbit usually you get small right and and that that helps you hide but you also have to hide from radar there's something called the space fence it's set up in kwajalein island and it can monitor it right now it just got set up and started working this year oh, i'm sorry last year it can spot things the size of a golf ball and they have to identify what those are, see if there's things that are going to hit, see if there's any space weapons, if there's weird maneuvering. This is all happening now. So, and radar is a big part of that. So one thing you do is make sure the radar waves under certain frequencies bounce off in different directions, just like a stealth airplane, except you're doing it in space. And then you have to hide from the optical telescopes, which is harder now because there's more telescopes going into space to look at the other satellites. 
So there is a huge cat and mouse game going on right now, including radar, um, ground-based and increasingly space-based, to see what the hell's going on up there. And it's China, Russia, and the United States are, are all sort of up there doing things, trying to figure out what, what each other are, are, are doing. So all that's real. And small satellites make all of this even more complicated. So because you yeah. can hide small satellites posing as space junk, and in conjunction, they can do all sorts of nasty stuff. So that is all more realistic than people want to think. It's not really kumbaya in space. It's a contested environment by militaries and government. Would it have been in 1979? Absolutely. Okay. But it would be a lot easier to hide stuff up there, except things were bigger. So I, I, well, I feel like I gave a trade-off, but I think it's more <laughs> active, complex, and high stakes now than even in 79, even during the Cold War, because there are more players, because there's more technology, because yeah. we're not under the firm rubric of mutually assured destruction. All those tent poles are not there. It's more Wild West now. That's what the people in the Space Force and space analysts have told me, independent of each other. They, they use the same, hey, it's like the Wild West up there now. So it, this is a more prescient aspect of this movie than Maybe they even intended, but but yeah. when I look at it, that's immediately where my mind goes. All right, just as a point of reference, the space station in Moonraker was 200 meters in diameter, which is about 656 feet. So it's a pretty big device. So anyway, that was cool, Joe. Thanks for enlightening us. And really, it makes things scary now. <laughs> the smartest spy in the room. <laughs> there you go. Right. I just talk to the smartest spies in the room. I'm not, I'm not either smart nor spy. <laughs> All right. So the, the and of course, uh, Drax wants to launch these globes, which have the this particular gas on board that's going to wipe out five billion people on Earth, roughly, because each one he said of his fifty globes can wipe out a hundred million people. So all right. So he's good for five billion. And this is kind of similar to what Blofeld was kind of doing in Honor Majesty's Secret Service as well. Those globes are a gadget to Drax. And you mm. say about 5 billion people. So in 1979, the Earth's population was about 4.4 billion. So he has a little wiggle room there in terms of the size. Now he doesn't have enough because we're at 7.8 billion people. But with the Earth covering as much geography as it does, there's the mountains, there's the oceans. How are only 50 globes going to distribute enough of this gas to kill 4.4 billion people? I'm, I'm calling this totally not believable. I kind of agree, too, because really it's the same kind of thing with Blofeld and on Her Majesty's Secret Service. Because in reality, you'd have to pretty much kill everyone on Earth because his space population really is kind of small. And it could be overtaken by survivors on Earth. So it would be tough, I think, to believe. If you go through that much genetic tailoring or, or specific, go with a biological weapon. You're going to get more bang for your buck. Your dispersal <laughs> methods are just as good. You know, you, th That's where he should have invested his, his ma weapons of mass destruction money if he was a villain of any you know, repute. All right, all you bad guys out there, don't listen to Joe. <laughs> There's a bad guy out there that can deliver nerve toxins that could kill just as many people that right now. I mean, you know, the North Koreans have ICBMs that you can mount. And those are space weapons, by the way. They shoot higher, warheads higher than the space station and come back down. So that's, to me, that sounds like a space weapon filled with toxic globes that can take out tens of thousands, hundreds of thousands of people, all of Seoul, really, millions with yeah. nerve agents. So, yeah. I mean, we've got a supervillain, if you really want one, who can use a space weapon loaded with nerve agents to kill millions of people right now. That's comforting. <laughs> Thank you. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> All right, let's get back to the small weapon then. <laughs> the wrist dart gun worn by Bond. I think that was a cool gadget, and it saved his life in the G-Force machine because he, he shot it out to stop it because the release button didn't work was jammed intentionally. And he shoots Drax with it as he escorts him out the hatch into space and through the airlock and so on. So this was a pretty cool little device activated by nerve impulses from the wrist. So sure, they had derringers stuck up sleeves in the 1800s and stuff. So why not a dart gun? And he had a couple of different kinds of darts he could load it with too, right? So wrist activated, of course, like he said. And I like when Bond uses it in the G-Force centrifuge machine. You see this quick flashback in his mind of him firing it in M's office at a painting on the wall, which was I thought was a nice touch in that sequence where that flashes through his head while he's almost losing consciousness. 
One aside here, when Bond shoots the painting in M's office, it is the portrait of King William III at the Battle of Boyne in 1690. Interestingly enough, Bernard Lee played William III in the 1937 movie, The Black Tulip. Oh, that's an interesting yeah. little tidbit, Vicky. That's pretty cool. I love when they tie stuff like that together. I yeah, just think yeah. that's really cool. Yeah, that's nice. This gadget actually got me thinking about how realistic it could be, right? Because like you say, they they have derringers and stuff like that. And my first and obvious comparison in the movies would be Spider-Man, right? shooting the webs from his wrists. I mean, it's almost the same type of thing. That started in August of 62, so that concept coming for, out in 1979 would have made sense. Then I started thinking about the other wrist-fired w- weapons, and as you mentioned, the Derringer, right? The Derringer on a spring release from the wrist. Now, the first movie that I could find that had such a thing was a movie called The Sheriff of Fractured Jaw in 1958. And the problem is the character has one of these spring-loaded guns, he goes to demonstrate it to somebody, this guy Tibbs, and the wrist thing doesn't come shooting out. Probably the best known example of it, though, is James West in Wild Wild West. He had the spring-loaded Derringer that worked really nicely. We also see something similar in Taxi Driver, Desperado, and Django Unchained. So to me, this wrist dart gun is totally believable. All right, what about the other space weapons they're using? I mean, we have laser guns and all this other kind of stuff. Joe, what's, what's up with all that? Well, I mean, you don't want to shoot a, an actual rifle in, in space if you're inside the space station. So that, that part makes sense. It, it brings to, to my sort of darkly sort of tinted mind two things. One, that there was an effort to design anti-personnel space weapons in the 50s called, it was part of something called Project Horizon, and it was an armed moon base. That's low gravity, not zero, but they weren't big on guns. They liked mines and things that, that wouldn't, shoot a projectile all the way around the moon. So the idea that you're designing weapons specifically for use in space, while not something the U.S. or anyone else is actually doing, the planning has been done before. So it wasn't that absurd back then to think the Cold War is going to extend. We're going to have armed troops that would have to operate in the space environment. All right, well, now fast forward. Now we're talking about, you know, the space is a contested military domain and the possibility of, of uniform members on military missions in orbit. So what weapons would they carry? Normally they'd carry weapons for when they come back down. But if they were to carry something, why not a laser weapon? Lasers in space can do a lot of things. I don't know how far down the rabbit hole you guys want me to get, but they're a great weapon, especially in space, not inside a space station, but outside the space station. You can blind another satellite or another spacecraft with lasers. You can burn a hole in in the skin, make it spin out of control, or destroy it flat out with the energy of it. So laser space weapon always to me is yes, yes, yes. Now as an anti-personnel weapon, they're better than Star Wars blasters, this portrayal, to be honest. They're great for space because you don't have to reload them. Uh, you recharge them. That's a great aspect. Restocking is a real pain or rebuilding whatever you need. They also give you the range of something. So you could set the, you know, the power based on how far it is. You know, laser range finding is, it's invisible, but it happens all the time. So again, laser space weapon, I like it. So maybe more so than, than most. And the idea of, of space marines or space troops is not as far-fetched now as it, as it certainly it even was back in the 70s. But I'm, I'm glad to hear you say that because that was one of the parts of this movie that I, I've been like, come on, really? But you're telling me, yeah, really? That may save the last third of the movie. <laughs> yeah, because that actually, that actually <laughs> makes I it sound the first more third, so I owe you. <laughs> yeah, thank you. So that's, that's good. That's pretty good. I mean, Drax, of course, he had all these weapons as well, not only just the United States. So he was pretty efficient at producing high-tech stuff. And we saw the prototype, actually, of of the laser in Q's lab in Rio. Yeah, the guy shooting it and melts the guy, the yeah. the mannequin's head. When they're firing laser weapons and you see a blue light or a green light or a red light or whatever, would you actually see light when you fire a laser weapon, Joe? Well, I, the thing that I don't like about the visible laser weapons, you you might. After all, there's tracers that are used on modern weapons and they're used to know where the hell you're shooting so but they're also a way that you know where you're being shot at from so would every single laser pulse cause a light or i would think no you don't want to give away your own position no matter who you're shooting at it's a line of sight weapon don't forget so someone can see you when you're shooting at them 
Yeah. Well, and, and you're saying it's a tracer. The laser inherently is going to be invisible, right? It's something. Yeah, unless you decide to make it so, okay. and then to make it, yeah. you would design it so that you could see every third pulse, so you'd know where you're shooting, just like every tenth bullet or what have you, and you yeah. could calibrate that to zero if you wanted to have a shot where you didn't want to be seen. So that would be something that would, that it would and would you color code it like uh, sports teams? Maybe, you, you know, you don't want, is that a friendly fire avoidance mechanism or is that a way for someone to know every one of your positions if they're looking? So again, you could color code that. That would be part of your battle strategy going in. Hey, we're green. Don't shoot at green. <laughs> at at 1300, we're switching to red. Like that, that could yeah, be part of your ops. Like right? an army uniform, right? It's like, hey. Exactly. Yeah, yeah. So, so I, love, I love blazers for that, but I don't like blasters, right? I don't like Star Wars, you know? And I really don't like the way that Star Trek does it either, necessarily, because that visible beam is not the best way that that's not going to happen. Yeah. Well, hey, Goldfinger Jazz is up too, so we could see it. So that was nice. <laughs> yeah, everything is jazz with him and gold. And he, it was all about the bling. Yeah. All right, we talked about the wrist gadget that Bond used, the little dart gun. So he has this nice little Seiko watch that contains plastic explosives just in case Bond needs to blow something up. And, you know, hey, sometimes you do have to blow things up, like a metal grate in a rocket pit or something. You might need it. Okay, it's cool, but I don't know how you'd have enough plastic explosives hidden in a watch to blow up even the watch. I mean, I, I don't know. Maybe I'm wrong. But when he opens it, you see this nice little spiral coil of, of plastic explosives. So, I don't know. Maybe there is enough. C4 is a term associated with plastic explosives, but there's relatively new plastic explosives now called EPX1, which are it's far more powerful. We see in Die Another Day, Bond's Omega Seamaster 300M has a detonating pin built into the watch to detonate C4. So you need a detonating device. So in Moonraker, let's just say it's an explosive idea that Q has for a useful gadget. I don't know. Is there enough in a little watch like that to blow something up significantly, Joe? I don't know. Uh, no, but <laughs> uh, you know, it's, it's in the movies, plastic explosives or all explosives are only as exactly as powerful or as weak as they need to be at the time. So <laughs> that's just the rule of thumb. He's always got just enough. You don't probably need much, but you're not in any, just any environment. You're in a rocket, something that's built to take high amounts of energy. Everything in a rocket stand is built rugged and thick and hard and every great, what they don't want during a launch is, a, is an explosive overpressurization event to blow the, a grate or any other piece of equipment up back into the rocket or into the, where all the pressurized tanks are back onto the stand. So Everything is super hard and super reinforced. No matter how much explosives he thinks he needs, this isn't a sewer system. This is a, you know, this is built to take extreme amounts of punishment. So he's got to use more than any other environment. So I think he used way too little. I'm no expert on plastic, but I know I, I know a lot about rocket test stands and nothing is tied down loosely. So... Yeah, there you go. All right, that's a good point. Here he's using also in Moonraker a rocket powered boat, and he wants to escape Jaws, who's in pursuit. This rocket powered boat that's got all kinds of gadgets on this thing, of course, including a hang glider that <laughs> Q was brilliant enough to anticipate a need for. I mean, it drops mines, it does all kinds of other things, right? Yeah. You can imagine a, a fast boat like this. I think we can propel this idea to the top and kind of believe it in terms of the boat. <laughs> I actually like how they took the what they did in From Russia with Love with the boat chase there at the end where you had the stuff shooting and the things exploding in the water and stuff. Yeah. And they, I like the twist of putting the hang glider on this thing. It was, that, yeah, you, that was kind of nice. You, you want to put the hang glider in there just in case <laughs> Bond would would go over a waterfall. And son of a gun, he, he does. And he has the hang glider, which was brilliant. I mean, Q is just amazing with that kind of stuff. I just, wow, such anticipation. He should get a promotion, I think. He was good. <laughs> Q was good. All right. <laughs> hey, let's not forget uh, Holly Goodhead. She has a few cool gadgets, too provided by the CIA. She's got the little black diary book that fires a dart out of its spine. Darts were big in this movie. 
Darts are, darts are good. And, you know, real spies have used darts to kill people and, and so on in real life. So, uh, so yeah, darts, I think, are a good, a good little device. And she's got a very cool device that shows, it looks like a pen. And, and it, it really shows that a pen is mightier than the sword because we see, of course, we saw that in GoldenEye too, that when clicked, this ejects a poisonous liquid. Well, Bond finds this pretty useful. So he, he finds this gadget and he uses it when he's fighting the python in that beautiful lair, the lagoon in Brazil. And of course, after he kills the python, he swims out. Whew, thank God that's over and it's Jaws he's, he's facing again. Beautiful there in the tropics with the waterfalls. I thought that was kind of cool. But there's one frozen waterfall, and it looks like a frozen waterfall. I guess it's really stalactites clinging to the ceiling, but they're clinging to the ceiling of a man-made enclosure. So I didn't understand that unless they built around it just to save that feature. But I thought, eh, that's a little weird. But it's beautiful, and I like that part. She also has a flamethrower. Holly Goodhead, right? She's got this perfume. Yeah, it's the Christian that, that Christian Dior perfume bottle she's got. Yeah. But I don't see an ignition source on that thing. So, like, I believe that it's a believable device, but I don't see where the flame comes from. I mean, I understand the propellant shooting the, the stuff that's going to be ignited, but I don't see an ignition source. Maybe it's got a hidden flint like a cigarette lighter, you know? <laughs> mm-hmm. I don't know. <laughs> Considering this movie, it's got a little laser igniter. You just didn't see it. <laughs> ah, hey, there you go. I like that. <laughs> <laughs> then her wonderful gadget is the purse uh, with the antenna. <laughs> that's that's a good one. Standard issue CIA stuff. And uh, what the hell? That's good, I guess. Okay, uh, so what about the gadgets that Q showcases at the Brazilian monastery? Bolas yeah. used to lasso cattle's feet together in the film, but they come in exploding form. I love that gadget. The machine yeah. gun gaucho. It looks silly and it sounds silly, but a similar deception device was used in the Second World War. And what about the laser gun? When I personally see the monk in the Jedi Knight type habit firing the gun, I always think of Star Wars. Yeah, how could you not? Yeah, no, Joe, would it really melt rubber like that? So you've got the, the rubber head kind of just melts and a line goes across the middle of it, but he's shooting it all at one point. So Depending on how much power you put into it, it'll melt anything. Okay. I mean, all right. It's, it's, it's very nimble, our lasers. So you could get it powered that you could etch a smiley face on it or burn it straight through, really. All right. So we're, we're really, I think we covered most of the gadgets in the movie so far. I think all the all the major ones and some of the minor ones as well. And it's beautiful that, uh, that, that MI6 will ship this stuff all over the world for Bond, which is nice, no matter how big the device is, boats, gondolas, whatever. It's nice. So what about the last scene, though, Joe? I, I, I don't know. Where <laughs> they finally tune in to Bond and Holly Goodhead returning to Earth. It, it appears <laughs> as though they're having sex in zero G. I, I, I don't know. Uh, you know, for someone who's so good at it, and maybe it's just because he was in space for the first time, he was not doing it correctly. <laughs> the choice that we were actually witnessing sex occurring, if they were doing it that way, is actually pretty, pretty low. <laughs> A, you're in zero G, so you want to make sure that you're somewhere where fluids and such aren't going to just float willy-nilly all over your space tank. So, Well, that was what the that, covering was for. To catch that. Right. Uh, just, just, just. Also, more importantly, I think someone has to be the fulcrum, right? Someone's got to be. Someone's got to be attached. You know, you, you, you want to just get a sleeping bag and attach it to a wall so that you have something to work off. Because otherwise, you're going to be flying all over the place, and it's going to be uglier than prom night. So, <laughs> uh, I think they were just cuddling. I think Bond was caught cuddling, and I think that that's the big joke of the movie, you know. Well, well, wait. Well, so then Q is is wrong then when you know Frederick Gray is is appalled by this, and of course so is M. And when it's just like, what is Bond doing? And then Q says, "I think he's attempting re-entry, sir." Attempting. Q's never wrong. I think he's okay, all right. exactly what was going on. Attempting. <laughs> like Panda's so Q is actually smarter, breathe. even smarter than we thought. Smarter. I mean, he says attempting. 
So she would have needed to have been tied down for that to work. Tied That's down what Joe's saying. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, get a sleeping bag. Okay. Anyway, if if you intend to have sex in space, please listen to this again. And Joe's got some good points there. <laughs> Thank you. <laughs> <laughs> they pay me for. <laughs> and I love the the blanket stayed in place anyway. That was nice in zero G. It was, it was good. On that high note. You should say mile high note. <laughs> yeah. On that mile high note. That's good joke. We're going to wrap up our dissection of gadgets in Moonraker. We want to thank our special guest and smartest spy in the room, Joe Papalardo, for joining us again. Joe, it's always fun. Thanks a lot. Appreciate Thanks, you all having me. This has been Dan Silvestri. And Tom Pizzotto. And Vicky Hodges. A spymovienavigator.com. Subscribe to our show, Cracking the Code of Spy Movies, through your favorite podcast app right now. Follow us on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, too. Thanks for listening. We appreciate it.